Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures, a show where my guests and I get to explore entrepreneurial stories, market landscapes, problem spaces, and examine together how new ventures might be able to be created, either for-profit, non-profit, or personal ventures, to benefit humanity. Really, the purpose of this show is to educate and inspire a new generation of venture builders and venture investors to make the world a better place. In today's episode, my guests Kyle and Franzi are part of the Bird Buddy team. Bird Buddy is a smart bird feeder that has now raised over $2 million on Kickstarter. So we have an opportunity to explore their backgrounds, how the idea came about, the iterations of that idea, how it was validated, how the, the journey leading up to the Kickstarter and even through the Kickstarter and ultimately the vision for uh, the product, both the hardware and the software, and how it was inspired by Pokemon Go, and we dive into all of that. So if you are listening to this show, you can also watch it by visiting wclittle.com, and there you'll see more extensive show notes to the things that we talk about today. And if you're watching, you can listen to it anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for Ventures. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Kyle and Franzi. All right, Franzi, Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So Franzi, would you mind uh, kicking us off and telling us a little bit about your background? Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, my name is Franzi. Uh, I'm from Slovenia, Ljubljana, that's basically Central Europe next to Italy and Austria. Um, and I've been a developer for about 15 years, although it's hard to remember at which year exactly I started to do some coding. Uh, and I've always been interested in stuff that's kind of on the edge, basically. So something that's not quite there, but it's you know it's getting there. Um, I've built a company that does web apps and mobile apps, so like a studio uh, that now employs about 20 people. And from that spun off a couple of startups, right? Uh, two of them being you know, they're still alive, but not, not doing particularly great. And now the last one, super exciting one is, is Bird Buddy, which is a smart bird feeder that I guess we're, we're here to talk about today. That's great. Kyle, welcome. Can you tell us a little, little bit about your background? Sure. Yeah, my background's in industrial design. <clears throat> so I started out, did six inter internships around the world, uh, landed in the Bay Area in 2009. Uh, worked at a consultancy there, did a lot of work with Google and Cisco and Dell and a lot of uh, kind of the major companies out there, as well as a lot of kind of biotech and medical startups. Um, came to Chicago in 2013, um, did a lot of brand innovation work and partnering with a lot of kind of pre-seed and, and kind of angel round uh, startups and entrepreneurs that had patented something or were trying to bring an idea to market. So um, over the span of about four and a half years there, I started working on uh, some of my own projects, um, obviously kind of came into the Proto network and have been uh, full time with Proto since 2017. Love it. It's been a joy working with you. So Bird Buddy, I just saw this morning you passed the two million mark raised on Kickstarter. Let's let's talk a little bit about, about this. Francie, where, where did where did the idea come from? Um, well, it did come from me. So it's uh, basically it's a friend of mine who who pitched this uh, last December, right? Uh, basically, me coming from the states uh, from one of the you know, startups that we've we've been working on, uh, and kind of looking for something new to 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 get me excited, right? Um, and so it was a late night, a couple of beers in, basically, and uh, I kind of extracted it from him, right? Because he wasn't too willing <laughs> about sharing his amazing startup idea, right? And uh, but yeah, he ended up, you know, uh, kind of pitching it uh, like this, you know, what about creating a bird feeder with a, with a camera, right? So how, how nice would that be? And we had a long conversation throughout the night, basically, in terms of how you could gamify it, how this could be something like Pokemon Go, just, you know, with something that's actually there, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was December, and then nothing happened for a while, although I was pretty adamant that this seems like a good idea, right? And really wanted to <laughs> test it. Um, and, and at some point, somebody actually here in the Slovenian Kickstarter ecosystem approached us that Kickstarter is launching in Slovenia, right? So they'll be opening up doors for actual like Slovenian companies, uh, you know, Slovenian entities basically to, to launch their projects in Kickstarter. 
And if we have something interested and we might, might want to launch, right? And we have had those discussions that Kickstarter would be a great platform for this. And it was just like a, you know, a cake basically that got us started. Uh, and then we put together a, like a simple uh, pre-launch website. I, I did actually the first renders of, of Bird Buddy, which were completely different from what we have right now, right? Everyone would probably not even doable because it was like, it seemed like a very thin wooden box, basically. I mean, it kind of looked nice, right? And it looked nice to enough people that, you know, we knew that there's some traction there and the conversions were cheap and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, like technically probably not doable and not even a good idea to do it like that. Uh, but yeah, it, that that really worked well. Like uh, over the past, I don't know, three or four years, because I've been to a couple of accelerators as well. I, I've learned a lot about how to do things the right way, right? Mm -hmm. And it's 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 hard to do things the right way, uh, you know, but in this time, basically, there was like everything was in place where we could test everything in a pretty cheap way. And for every step that we took, like we knew that, you know, everything before that kind of aligned and we knew that this next step makes sense, right? Um, so we've done a lot of testing in terms of how much it costs us, uh, you know, to get a conversion, to get one email and compare that to kind of the industry standard for Kickstarter pre-launch pages and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the a bit longer version of how this came to be, right? But I think that Giga, who's my co-founder, had this idea for a while because I've, I've been hearing from a lot of different people like because we, we we share a lot of friends right and we're from the same uh, like uh, yeah uh, group basically uh, that they've heard this idea years ago right <laughs> so right. <laughs> this was something that was that was kind of there like lingering but it never really like you know I, I guess found fertile ground to actually you know take off basically uh, and at this point uh, like as I've mentioned before it was just enough on the edge that it seemed like very interesting and you know like exciting also uh, from a technological standpoint because it includes AI and stuff like that but also it, it just barely doable right because just just recently you have you know TensorFlow Lite and libraries that actually allow us to build stuff like that so it's not something that you could have done five years ago probably not right or, or 10 years 10 years ago, definitely not, right? But but now it seems like the right time to actually do something like that at, at a cost where, you know, it could actually be mass produced and, and, and delivered. So this is a pr pretty common story. A lot of the people listening in are entrepreneurs. They have different, a lot of different ideas, side hustles, curious, like when to leave the day job. How did you, at what point did you, did you get serious about beginning to test the idea? And what, and what did those initial tests look like? So I mean, my my I, I was driving for us to test earlier, right? Because the thing is that from from experience, basically, one thing that I know is that if you have a great idea, you don't need awesome visuals, you don't need a you know awesome design or like whatever. You you just need to, a, a way to pitch that idea to your audience, right? Um, and and you know, Giga being the product guy who needs things to be perfect, he kind of uh, pushed us to actually have awesome design. Have you know, everything had to be awesome. So I guess that uh, at, at some point like the the kickstarter you know like we need you to actually prepare for launch in you know end of year was actually kind of the the kick to the groin that you know we need to get this done as soon as possible uh but other than that uh again this being a hardware product it's it's one of those things that's easy to test because you can create like a render you can create a couple of screen of the app and it's the you know it's a consumer product so you can advertise it on facebook and that's that right so you don't necessarily have to because i i can't imagine how you do that like with a SaaS product who's like you know b2b or something like that that's much harder to test like at a volume just from you know your living room basically you have to go out to have meetings you have to pitch to you know uh, like a, 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 I don't know business executives and and get them on board with some initial orders and it's just a different ball game so I guess that in, in in our case because it is a consumer product and because it is something that's quite easily like presentable right the idea is not that outrageous everybody knows what a bird feeder is you know like combining those two things it seemed obvious to us and then obviously once we pitched this to the audience it also seemed to kind of resonate pretty fast right um so but but yeah i, I mean as i as i kind of uh, alluded to earlier basically like each step was kind of a if this doesn't go well we stop right <laughs> and and because because i i put my money on the line in, in this case and and uh I, I knew that I didn't want to waste money if I wasn't sure that, you know, everything up until then made sense, right? And so for each kind of test we wanted to do, we actually knew that there was a certain criteria we want to meet. 
like in, for example, we, we, we wanted to have you know a cost of a conversion. So we had a pre-launch website where people could leave their email, right? And we wanted that to be, I don't know, sub one USD, right? For one email, right? What, what it ended up being was 25 cents, which was a ridiculous little number. So we knew we were on, you know, on, on a great path to somewhere. But after that, okay, so we, we can get emails very cheaply, which means that there's a lot of you know, excitement and engagement around the product, but can we actually get those people to convert, right? So then we built like a fake uh, page where we uh, allowed people uh, kind of started their checkout process and then fail at some point and saw that there was like a, a really you know again a lot of a lot of uh, uh, people actually kind of trying to purchase the product right so the uh, another example was we built like a, a forum where you could kind of spec out your bird body and say look i want a great camera great housing great everything and then the price would adjust to see how you know how high of a price we can actually get out of this and 75% of the people actually were okay with the base price, 25 weren't, right? Mm. Uh, and out of the 75% of the people actually specced the hell out of the bird body, you know, to above 200 bucks, basically, which again, gave us like some indication that there was a, a willing list kind of to pay, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a pretty high price for a product like this, right? So a lot of things like that, and each each one was like a step where we knew that okay, if this doesn't go well, we don't have a business model, right? And yeah. and just it, it it kept confirming itself, and and now we're here. Yeah. So Kyle, you work with a lot of the the founders in the proto ecosystem that are building tangible products, IoT, things like Bird Buddy. What in in the in the process of of validating an idea, what have you seen? What have you seen work, and what have you seen not work? Uh, when it when it comes to the the tangible goods uh, hardware space, yeah, it's I mean every product is different, right? And there's a lot of different categories. There's a lot of different ways um, that you integrate technology or don't. A lot of different ways that man things get manufactured. Um, so there's a there's a pretty huge matrix of things that you want to test for and confirm are actually achievable, right? Before you um, make too much investment into things or spend too much time and resources into things. In this case, um, you know, we, we were kind of piggybacking off of technologies that are already familiar, right? As far as when you think about ring doorbell, a variety of streaming cams, things that exist, technologies that exist. Um, there are some specifics as far as our condition is concerned, as far as kind of the distance to the subject, for the camera, which is challenging, but that's Ooh. something that we definitely thought we could overcome, right? And then you think about, as, as Francie just mentioned, um, kind of the, the price sensitivity and what's it gonna take to manufacture this. Most of the time as a, as a startup in early stage, um, at, at this stage, it's, you know, what's the lowest volume we could get away with? Will we be able to make the margins work at that super low volume to get it out there, refine and test? Um, so all of those things kind of aligned in the case of Bird Buddy. Um, we saw the excitement, the market's enormous. Um, we felt pretty confident in our ability to manufacture it um, profitably in a way that makes sense for the business. So um, yeah, it's, it, it, things just kind of fell, in, fell into line the, uh, the way that we were really hoping they would. That's great. And so Franci, where, where did the Bird Buddy and Proda stories merge? How, how, how did, how did oh, the wow. connection happen? <clears throat> that was so random, yeah. <laughs> like I, uh, I, I actually uh, filled out a form from IOTERRA. Like I was, I was actually trying to get like a, a bomb, right? <laughs> and, and 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 after after uh, going to to Alibaba and other places, trying to because I, you know, as as Kyle mentioned, the 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 component set is not that exotic, right? It's 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 kind of standard stuff, right? Uh, and so I was I was quite confident in being able to predict what stuff we like generally would need you know uh, hardware wise um, and wanted to get like a basic idea of how much it would cost uh still you know i'm i'm no expert obviously so i i, I googled uh i'm not sure like bomb estimates or some online or whatever something like that and and ioterra's uh which is a group i'm, I'm not sure you know how how uh, how, how that connection works between Ioterra and, 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 and Proda, but it, it's a group, I guess, that does consulting in terms of, you know, connecting startups to, like, people that actually know how to build stuff. Um, yeah, and they have a website with an online bomb estimator or something like that, which is which is actually quite comprehensive, like, to a degree where I felt it was the perfect balance between me uh, not knowing a lot about hardware, being able to fill it out, but still fe feeling it's comprehensive enough for them to, to be able to give me, you know, a, a somewhat like solid estimate, basically. 
so then I went on a call uh, with Danny, who's uh, from Ioterra, and then he uh, was super nice uh, and very helpful. And we had a couple of calls, actually. Each call was just like, you guys are doing this for free, right? This is what, uh, what, what's your business model, right? All this advice I'm getting, what, what, you know, what, what's in it for you guys? Um, and, and I still don't know that, honestly. <laughs> so that's, uh, I'm still not sure how exactly that connects, but uh, yet, you know, uh, a very lovely experience. And then he basically connected us, I think, with, with, with Proda, like in, in general, right? He made that intro. And to a couple of other people as well. And then we had a call, uh, and I think that, I'm not sure whether the, fir the, the first call with Proto was with, with all of you, basically. Like, I think there were, you know, 30 yeah. people on the call, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so after that call, basically, um, yeah, uh, Kyle wrote to me, I think, that he's interested in, 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 in participating, right? Uh, and uh, we were, um, uh, you know, again, I was just so happy for, uh, I mean, for generally for, for getting that opportunity to pitch to you guys, but then also... Uh, to, uh, you know, obviously uh, striking a note or like just, 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 uh, it, it kind of helped me, um, you know, be a bit more confident that this is something that I want to do. Right. It's, it's, again, I have, I've, I've never done a hardware product and, uh, you know, having so many people on, on, on the call that actually are uh, very good at this all mostly in agreement that this is, you know, uh, something that could be a good business, right. Actually kind of validated a lot of things for me as well so uh i think that's that's how it all happened and and i'm super happy that it happened the way it did yeah that's great i mean it's, it was an honor to be able to hear hear your pitch work alongside uh you and the team for a little while be able to invest and you know full disclosure obviously proto is an investor and and uh as part of part of the team and our operator yeah. and your thesis uh, and a big shout out, shout out to Danny and Daniel at IOTERRA. We'll make sure to put a uh, a, a link to their site uh, for for founders that are in, that are in the hardware IoT space, so that uh, they can get more resources there. So that's wonderful. So Kyle, for those that for those entrepreneurs that are you know they're they're googling around, they're finding the the, the IOTERRAs and protas of the world. What advice do you have for them at this stage where they're just they're trying to get it to that next level? What what, what are what are things to do and, and things not to do? Yeah, no, that's a it's a great question. And again, it's it kind of comes down to where they're at in their idea, what their background is and what they're looking for as far as taking it to the next level. You know, are, are they if they have hardware experience and they need things on the on the software side to build stuff out. That's one scenario. If they're um, like in Francie's case, more familiar with the software side and need hardware help to build things out. I think just finding the right partners, um, going out to the networks, don't be afraid to ask and call and mm -hmm. connect with people and just be transparent about kind of where you're at and what help you need. And I think that that honesty and, and integrity will go a long way with the people that you speak with. Right. And so, Obviously, when, when Francie reached out to us and I was able to have, you know, a series of discussions together, it felt like our values were very much aligned. It felt like our skill sets were very complementary. And there was obviously excitement on both sides about the product. So I think just having as many conversations as you can um, with people that you think might be able to help. I think I've, I've had tremendous help along the way with so many different folks in my professional and, and personal you know, careers just as far as asking for help and being introduced to people and people's willingness to connect you with somebody else or just help directly. It's, it's amazing. So I think just don't be afraid to, to do that. Yeah. And in, in, in our VC and angel communities, there, there's a, there's a common saying that hardware is hard. So most, most angels and VCs won't touch hardware with a 10 foot pole. Um, why, let's talk about that a little bit, Kyle. Why, why is that? Why, why, why do you, why do you, why do you think VCs and angels say say that sort of thing? It's always interesting to hear the different perspectives, right? Like, Francie, even even just now hearing you say that, like, it's really easy to test a hardware product. <laughs> like, I, I'm oh, no. like kind of laughing. <laughs> and so, like, okay, all right. No, but I, I think it's it's. I, I think you're right. I think in some ways it is easier to test a value proposition on a hardware product like this, especially for a consumer where things are familiar, I think where it becomes hard is launching it and having to make final decisions really fast and really early 
um, because those things all have tremendous capital costs associated with them, right? When you think about cutting hardened steel for tools to do your injection molds, um, if you make if you change your mind later or need to iterate on that, that's a lot of money or potentially starting over. That that impacts cost, timeline, schedule, all, all these different things trickle back all the way back to your your you know business model. So I think it's hard because you kind of have one shot at it. Right. And as we're thinking about Bird Buddy and our success that we've had so far in the fundraise, um, you know, we, we go from thinking, OK, we could start out with an MOQ uh, or minimum order quantity of 5000 units. Um, at this point, we're thinking way more than that. Right. Because we, we feel really confident that we're going to have, you know, probably. Who knows, 20,000, 25,000 units uh, pre sold on Kickstarter alone, not to mention the time that it's going to take to get all the way to our launch and the ability to pre sell during that. So I think that's probably the hard part, right? It's, it's expensive and you kind of have to do it all right up front. Um, so that's where it becomes really challenging. It becomes imperative that we pick the right partners on the manufacturing side, that we have you know, the confidence in them, the communications and transparency that is required um, throughout the entire process to make sure that we understand where exactly things are at, what bottlenecks may exist in the schedule, and how we can communicate that if needed to our to our customers and, and backers. So um, it's, you know, my understanding of software is, is fairly limited as far as kind of the iteration, put out the beta, just iterate, it can be broken, it's okay. Okay, like that's not the case with hardware, and I think that's why there's that perception. Mm. So, Francie, as you were googling around looking for answer, looking for answers to different questions that you had, and and talk to Danny and, and Daniel, and and talk with Proda. What were some of those initial questions as as Kyle was running point from our group? What were some of those initial questions and things that you were you were looking for help with? Because it sounds like you had some early validation, yeah, early sure. tests that you were running. What 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 were those those early days with Proto look like? I mean, basically, my main question was, uh, you know, can we get the so what what would the cost of the of uh, uh, manufacturing unit be, right? So cost landed basically, and I've learned those terms, right? So that's not something that I've I've uh, I came into Bird Buddy uh, understanding. Uh, because you know there's a bomb and then there's a cost of goods and then there's cost landed which basically means that it's in your warehouse if i'm if i'm correct right and and all of those are 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 different and they can be different by a lot right and that impacts a lot uh you know how, how you actually price the unit and what your business model is going to be so i guess uh, again being being concerned with the fact that uh, or with, with the question whether this is something that can actually provide for a for a, a sustainable or you know kind of growing business basically uh was what would the cost of the unit be what the logistics look like you know how do you do shipping you know how do, do you bake that into the price then you have a bunch of different tax questions uh you know tax implications in the states and in, in the eu and you have a vat here and all that stuff so from my, my my concern as 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 you can see basically mainly was the cost right so yeah. uh, and and everything else i i felt like you know if we get the right people on board we're just going to make it work right so i knew of the you know like ring cameras and stuff like that like before all of that and and was uh, you know i had enough of an idea of of the tech involved that i was confident that we can execute it and if we're smart you know we can do it in a way that's also cost effective but but other than that, I was I was very much uh, like relying on on finding the right people to help us out, you know, in, in, in this case. So uh, my my initial research were was mostly in terms of can I understand the costs and then can I find find the right people to help us execute it, right? And I think we're we're on a great like uh, you know path to actually uh, get both to a place where where we can actually build a nice yeah. business around. Yeah. And what was the so the design of the product of Bird Buddy in particular? What what, what was sort of the history of the the iterations of of that design? Did it start with the back of a napkin or something like that, and some tests. Or, uh, walk us through that a little bit. I mean, I'm I've uh, way back basically. I've worked uh, in, in 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 a very uh, enthusiastic manner basically a lot with Cinema 4D, right? Doing a bunch of different animations, and I was I, I just liked the you know the like the the creating art in 3d that actually was was uh you know uh nice basically but anyway yeah so i, I had experience in building 3d stuff but nothing you know in terms of industrial design and, and product design right so I, I had no idea of material choice or anything like that but you know having said that 
I've put together like the first rendering, which was again like a, a very uh, basic, uh, like a bird feeder design, 3D, uh, you know, box with a with a triangle roof, obviously, that had very thin walls and like a a, a, a tube of seats basically in, in the middle, and that that worked for presentation purposes, and we got some feedback from from people that were already. Uh, joining our our uh, pre-launch list uh, in terms of you know how they see issues with that design and we try to improve on it. Uh, mm. At some point, uh, we engaged with an industrial designer here in Slovenia, uh, who helped us out, like refine that design. And we also took a lot of input from various uh, bird expert organizations and ornithologists and stuff like that, where we already tried to kind of you know understand. Uh, the the implications of certain design choices, right? So so what do birds like? Uh, what colors do they like? What's the what generally speaking should be the design uh, because they uh, kind of like to have a good view of the you know of of their surroundings because of predators and stuff like that. Uh, you need to have a roof that that goes well over the the container where the seeds lay basically because of uh, water you know cool. and and the risk of of uh, mold. Uh, you have to have uh, a drainage holes at the bottom, and just, so anyway, a, you know, a bunch of stuff like that, uh, which which we've kind of tried to incorporate, and and then at some point, uh, Kyle engaged, right? So we we had I think three versions at that point, something like that, and a couple of iterations. Uh, but I, I think it all really kind of, uh, I mean, we all fell in love with the design that, that Kyle came back with, basically, I think that, I think it was the, the second version or, or even the first version, because it was, it's, it, it was so, um, I don't know, I, I, I feel like uh, there, there are some things that just, you know, scream bird buddy, and they're soft, and they're nice and wholesome and, and warm, and like it's, uh, you know, it, we're, we're trying to be that kind of brand, genuinely, right? Um, and and I think that the design as it is right now really kind of spoke to all of that. Right? It, it was a very friendly design, basically, and it didn't look like it's for kids or for you know uh, your your grandma. It's for it's for everybody. Uh, and and still, basically, it has that that nice kind of it, it, it very neatly captures what I think Bird Buddy is as, as a brand. And and uh, that's hard, but but it it we we definitely got there, yeah. and and pretty fast, I think. It's wonderful. So obviously your Kickstarter video does an amazing job telling the story <laughs> around the, the why, you know, the birders around the world and 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 enthusiasts who, who appreciate knowing the birds that are coming in around their backyard. Uh, there's there's something about us as humans that really enjoys connecting with with nature and just love love the kind of overall why. But I'd love to sure. love to dive into a little bit of the nerdy product details for a minute, if you if you wouldn't <laughs> mind humoring me. What what decisions did you make around some of the materials and and some of the ways that it was specifically designed, um, and even around some of the 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 AI and and how you're using hardware and cameras and things like that. Maybe uh, yeah, Franzi, would you mind maybe kicking us off and telling us a little bit yeah. of how you were thinking about the the, the product and materials and such. So I'll, I'll let Kyle talk about the materials, but but like in, in terms of the, the 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 product generally, I I feel like again, uh, Pokemon Go uh, is is like a, um, I mean it's definitely an inspiration, right? In terms of allowing people to interact with something in the real world. Only in this case, it's not just a geolocation, right? But it's actual, you know, uh, wild animals. So it, it 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 seemed like a perfect fit to actually gamify a concept that's that's already amazingly popular, even though you know, it 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 doesn't feel like that cuz i'm not sure if you know i'm i'm or i'm sure that a lot of the you know your your listeners are not aware that that bird feeding is the second largest hobby in the states right and about 50 million people in the states actually consider themselves bird feeders right mm -hmm. so it's it's the kind of thing that 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 actually just just asks for gamification or for putting it in, into some kind of uh, digital context, right? Where uh, we we do so much like a lot of things are gamified that are just you know meh or I don't know <laughs> shouldn't be or are, you know don't don't really add that much value to it. But this is definitely something where where you know you can you can engage with the subject matter a lot more and often and in a meaningful way because of that kind of tech, right? And and AI. 
just recently, as I mentioned before, just recently got to a point where it can actually facilitate that, right? So uh, recognizing birds is not that hard. They have very distinct patterns. I mean, there are certain birds that are very similar and it's it's hard to tell, you know, between them even for an AI algorithm. But if you, if you um, uh, let's say filter for a specific geolocation, right, that, that works. So if you say, you know, I'm only interested in birds that, that commonly appear in Minnesota or, you know, in, in uh, New York or in, in Delaware or whatever, uh, you can actually get a very, very good um, result in terms of recognizing specific bird species, right? And that's, so that's one part of it. Uh, and, and the other one, because that's, that's kind of the core of bird buddy, right? And being able to kind of tap into your, your backyard and see birds, you know, as, as they're there. But the other one also kind of going back to Pokemon Go is that this is an activity that you can also take on the go, right? And that's that's the one thing that actually excites me uh, a lot because we haven't really explored it that much, even in prototyping and kind of, you know, uh, figuring it out. But we definitely can recognize birds based on their songs, right? And uh, the, the crazy zoom cameras that you have in phones these days where you have like 5X uh, optical zooms and you know, I'm sure you'll have 10X in, in a year or two, right? Can actually allow you to take photos of birds while you're out and about, right? And and I think that actually unlocks an amazing like opportunity to to take this whole activity that's, you know, in, in this first version of Bird Buddy will mostly be uh, locked to your backyard and to whatever happens there. But then it can actually you know open the doors to you having this activity on the go and enjoying you know bird watching in a in a much more like uh, uh, regular way, right? So I, I, again, I feel like there's there's so much to unpack there and so many opportunities in terms of how you can gamify it and how you can make it more meaningful. That this is you know the first version of Bird Buddy will basically just kind of scratch the surface, right? Yeah, and in terms of the, the the product design and materials, and Kyle, you want to comment on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, and Francie did a great job of kind of explaining why we ended up where we did. I think from from my perspective and and the industrial design perspective, it really was about making something that felt in line with the brand. Which you know, as, as we align on what that is, it's really this kind of friendly, kind of fun brand that that it's it's not necessarily too playful like there is tech involved and it has a kind of a sophisticated edge to it as far as technology goes but like it was really trying to figure out the balance between something that was super fun and playful and something that was kind of more tech focused and so where we where we arrived is something that has the familiarity of what you might recognize as a birdhouse or bird feeder um, it has the softened edges and things to make it more approachable and bring kind of a fresh design attitude to the space that hasn't really been done before. Um, and then it has the tech components, right, that, that are called out as far as like a large looking gloss lens, some immediately identifiable features um, to be able to tell that this is a connected device. And so one of the really useful things about um, kind of Francie and Giga's original experiments, building that email list and engaging with those early potential customers is the fact that we could go back to them with really kind of nicely designed uh, surveys mm. through the site, you know, as we were engaging with them on a weekly basis or, or more through the process and ask them like, hey, here's some material and color options. Which one would you guys lean toward? And we did a, a series of iterations with our customers through the process to be able to decide how important things like sustainability, mm. um, perceived sustainability through things like natural post uh, consumer materials, adding things like speckle into the finish. Um, and it really helped us narrow it down and, and come up with a kind of a final color and material combination that that was generally liked by, by nearly everybody, right? Mm. There was obvious preferences one way or another, and that's why we decided to make the, uh, the kind of the bold yellow an unlockable feature um, because it was definitely significantly less, but it was a, a meaningful amount of people who really preferred the yellow. So we were happy that we got to that point um, in being able to unlock that and offer both to, to make everybody um, more or less happy. So um, yeah, as we, as, and as we think about materials specifically, you know, I've mentioned briefly uh, recycled materials and things that we can do on there with kind of bioresins and, I think there's a there's a whole other angle to Bird Buddy that's really exciting uh, for us, which is you know kind of the conservation and what happens with that data, which maybe we'll get into here. Um, but as we think about that and how it relates to the brand and how it relates to just kind of 
what people are doing, like why are the bird feeding, some of it's gamification, some of it's to help with conservation efforts, some of it's to engage with nature. I, I think there's, there's a relatability to recycled materials and things that we can do from a sustainable angle with the product itself to, if not have it be recycled or recyclable, um, have it be modifiable and extend its life in various ways so that if something breaks or something goes wrong, it's not something that goes into a landfill. It's something that can be repaired mm. or it could be disassembled to be recycled. I, I think there's a lot of ways that we can play with that from a design perspective, even now as we think about it as an architecture to, to bring that in, and infuse it into the design from, from right here. So on a more basic level then, the, the appreciate that, on a more basic level, it's a bird feeder, it's got a camera, it has an app associated with it, you put it out in your yard. How is it, how is it powered? Yeah, it's gonna be, well, there's gonna be options, right? So, so probably the most common use will be having it powered from a lithium ion battery that's gonna be housed inside the detachable module. Um, we are designing it in a way that you could potentially route a cable out um, to an outlet and leave it plugged in all of, all of the time. Um, for people who have that option. And then we also, when we hit 950K, uh, we unlocked a solar roof option, um, which we're gonna have designed also in a way to where you can route the cable in and have it plugged into the module to kind of be continuously trickle charging that battery and extend the battery's life. So we're, we're trying to provide as many options as we can for people um, who are going to be really heavy feature users of, of the video streaming and some of those other things that could draw down the battery. Um, and then for other folks, uh, you know, who don't necessarily use all those features all the time, you know, um, we're going to have options for, for them to um, have, a, have a really useful long battery life. That's awesome. So from, from a inspiration standpoint, Pokemon Go, you mentioned, so the, the, there'll be an app. So I will have, I'll have an app on my phone. I'll get to see yep. the different birds that come and, and, and interact with the bird buddy. And, and where does it go from there? It sounds like earlier, Francie, you had a, a number of different, I think, um, sure. really interesting ideas around where, where this can go. Where, where, where is it out of the gate? What are the features going to be? And then kind of how, how are you thinking about the, 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 the features sure. and the gamification around bird, for, for bird lovers all, all around the world? So uh, yeah, like obviously the core feature set is you know being able to live stream video from the bird buddy and then being able to take high quality photos of of those birds, right? Uh, another like core feature is AI being able to recognize which which bird actually visited you. But then as soon as you have you know if if you imagine and, and as Kyle mentioned we we we've already passed ten thousand backers and by the end of the campaign we'll probably have. 20, 25, uh, thousand, which means that there will be a significant amount of bird buddies, you know, out in the wild right off the gate, right? So that that opens up uh, really kind of crazy, you know, opportunities for us to, uh, if if available, you know, that use that data to actually create some really crazy, you know, mechanics basically. So one one interesting way would be to actually show uh, kind of generalized bird maps of where certain birds, you know, tend to kind of visit, uh, and allow you to actually, you know, explore places where you know you don't often go and actually uh, find those birds, you know, in a in a forest or in a, a neighborhood near you. Um, then uh, there, there was another interesting concept where uh, Kyle actually shared this this uh, window swap thing, which is like it, it's it's I'm not sure whether it's kind of an experiment, uh, but where people actually put uh, webcams and uh, and point them outside into their backyard, and you can actually uh, kind of uh, window swap with them basically. So you go on there and you browse people's you know uh, backyards, or they just shoot out in the street and stuff like that, and it's a very kind of meditative experience, right? You actually see like a nice water fountain mountain and there you know I've, I've actually ran into uh, situations where, where, where those webcams were pointed at, at bird feeders right so you were actually already kind of you know window swapping and watching birds um, so a, an idea that actually was what was gigas is that you could create sort of like a marketplace where you know you have let's say 20 30 40 types of birds in your backyard right uh, but then you have this bird that you really want to take a photo of, but you, you know you'll just never see it because it never comes, right? And it's just maybe not even in your region, uh, where you could actually uh, create like a bit of a marketplace and share your bird buddy with somebody else's who wants to take a photo of a bird that often 
visits you, right? And you can actually uh, kind of take control of their bird body and, you know, take a photo of a bird that you really want to see, right? So you could kind of create that that uh, really interesting mechanic between users of bird body, right? Where they can kind of share share their 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 bird bodies within the community. Um, and then, you know, uh, last but not least, obviously, again, all that data could provide some seriously uh, useful information to bird conservation experts, right? Uh, and and it's a so gathering data about bird migrations and bird populations has been historically super hard, and it's very resource and, and capital intensive because you have to have people out there, you know, catching birds in in a lot of different places, and it's just something that doesn't come easy. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the big year competition which like every year, basically people compete uh, who can actually document the, the most bird species, right? And some people actually dedicate their lives to it. Like they, for the whole year, they, they travel the world and try to document as many bird species as they can, right? So it's like a, it's a crazy, you know, adventure basically that, that uh, I guess is, is still kind of gaining on popularity, right? Uh, and, you know, again, uh, having thousands of bird buddies all around the world, right? just means that we have thousands of potentially like monitoring stations that can actually provide very useful information to, to, to bird conservation experts. Where it, it, you know, until now it would be next to impossible to know for sure that, you know, that bird has visited that neighborhood or, you know, that city or something like that. Now it can actually be done. And with the volume of, of bird buddies that we might actually get into people's backyards, that can actually be a, you know, substantial, the kind of source of information for for making those kinds of predictions and 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 also understanding bird migrations which change a lot because of the impact of global warming and stuff like that right so it's it's very important now maybe even more than ever to understand how those change right it's because it's not the same anymore and it, it, it actually can get pretty uh, kind of dr dramatically bad right and and not knowing is worse than than having that information so uh, i guess that uh, inadvertently, right? We'll, we'll we'll create that data set that can have a, a large impact on understanding what's happening with with, with uh, bird populations. Uh, yeah. So speaking of bird con conservation specialists and scientists out there, I, I believe the term is ornith ornithology and ornithologists. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it, it is. And so. What are the questions? So you mentioned migratory patterns and others. What are the questions that the ornithologists out there are asking? And, and what kind of data, in addition to or sort of filling out, fleshing out a little bit what you just mentioned, you think will be interesting for the, the, the science sure. community around all things birds? So th I mean, there's actually some uh, feature requests that would be awesome if we could actually put it into Bird Body, right? <laughs> but, we, but we can't right now for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but for example, uh, it would be amazing if we had a small, uh, uh, what is it, a weight or a gauge or something to, to you know, to, to understand the weight of the birds basically on the step, right? Because that wouldn't only provide information of the, you know, which species it is, but also of the fitness of the bird, right? So how, how fat is it basically or, or how thin, right? So, uh, I mean, that, that's something that we've been asked, you know, that can you do that? And I would really like to say yes, but at this point I just can't, right? And, and it might actually come into play at some point in the future. Sure. Uh, but there are, there are things that, uh, uh, like for, for the most part, understanding uh, even just the volume, right? So how many birds visit a specific bird feeder uh, and you know, more um, in, in, in aggregation for the whole city or for the whole region or state or whatever, uh, that's, that's super important to understand how that mostly changes, not just like, you know, that one data point, but how that changes over, you know, years uh, and over different seasons, obviously. Um, and then another another aspect, which is which is not undoable even for version one, I guess, uh, kind of depends on the processing power that you put behind it, is understanding a specific uh, bird instead of the bird species, right? So what what we can do, uh, not not maybe with 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 uh, version one, but definitely down the road, we'll be able to actually tell that this is that specific bird, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to actually name it and say, look, this is this is Bob, right? And Bob <laughs> just visited you, and then you'll get a notification. Bob has been, you know, at a at another person's house. He's cheating on you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody has better seeds than you, or whatever, right? But uh, but but that's that's also kind of an exciting uh, you know uh, proposition because at that point they really do become like pets right or just like some some something much more intimate to just like you know birds who are visiting and, and leaving if if you know that that's that specific bird and you can see him on the map like roughly you know where he's flying or when he, where where he's going because again. Uh, 
hopefully there will be enough bird buddies around you know that that people will that, that will actually be able to get that data uh, that's another super interesting uh, like value not just for the fun you know aspect of it that i just mentioned but also for bird conservation right because uh, understanding that that specific bird flew all over the you know us to or or even to mexico or you know depending on the on the migration patterns uh, that's even more valuable information so it kind of depends on on um, on how far we can get with the tech that we have right now and then what else we can actually add in there to provide additional useful information but just by the but by the basic uh, standard of knowing that an X amount of uh, you know uh, blue jays visited a specific bird body this year and then less next year and then less next year maybe that that would be sad obviously right but that would be super useful as well to to uh, to experts um, so yeah and and I guess at, at some point they'll also have to figure out what to do with that information right it's, we'll, we'll just provide it we'll put it out there right yeah because presumably I, I as a bird bunny owner would be able to opt in and say yes I want to share the data with science yeah. and there'll be some kind of community forum for for the scientists and bird conservationists yeah, yeah. out there to access that data that's that's amazing yeah so we get a lot of questions about Kickstarter in particular, the strategy behind it. I know we had a lot of conversation internally about when, how, to what degree, how, how to go about doing it. And so I'm curious for you, Francie, is that for those that are that have maybe have a hardware product, they're you probably already have learned a lot around how you've talked about the early validation of it. But how right. should entrepreneurs, advice that you would have for entrepreneurs that are thinking about going the Kickstarter route, what, what, what would you say to them? Um, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too, um, how should I put that? I, I feel very lucky, right? Uh, that we've kind of landed into a space that's, that by default creates a lot of excitement, right? Mm. So, I mean, Bird Buddy, as, even the name Bird Buddy, uh, which, which I'm super happy that we actually landed on that name, right? It's uh, it just it just screams like uh, community, right? And some 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 like like a very happy approach to 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 whatever, right? And uh, so again, I feel very lucky that we've landed on a product or that you know the idea that we're pitching on kickstarter uh by default actually kind of creates that that uh, community that, that that you do need to launch a successful product right because uh, i i think that the most important uh part of, of our campaign was before it right and that was the from august until november uh when we were kind of building you know that audience and building the excitement uh, and without that nothing would have really happened right and and it, it it it's such a it's such a lovely topic that it's not hard to create content for right we you know blog posts basically write themselves uh, nice nice images but you know, it's just again uh it's it's not the hardest thing to to kind of get people excited about that helps a lot uh but uh, I, I think that the most useful advice I can actually uh, kind of provide is, is what I've just said, basically, that the most important part of Kickstarter is before Kickstarter, right? Not after, not what you do at launch, not what you do a week after or something like that. You actually have to find a group of people that are excited about your product um, and kind of engage them. Uh, you know, galvanize them, ask them questions, uh, get feedback, uh, appreciate their feedback, and come back with uh, something that actually took that feedback into account. So they'll see that you know it's it's act their, their uh, input actually makes a difference, right? Uh, and I guess that that's if if you can manage that, you're you're on a on a good you know path to actually succeeding. But but uh, the, again, the most important part being building that community. And uh, you know the, what what we've been lucky about is having a product that people actually care about and that you can get them excited about, right? Because it's it's hard for the twenty seventh uh, backpack with smart features to get people excited, right? Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's just that Bird Buddy in this case is really just uh, you know it's kind of unique, but also it has a huge audience, as I mentioned before. Yeah. You know, bird feeding being the second largest you know uh, hobby in the states, all, all of those things kind of clicked. Um, and I think that that's something you need to look for. Like, so maybe the first part of being successful in Kickstarter is to look for a product or, you know, try to pitch a product that already has some sort of a community and that is likely to create kind of, you know, excitement and, and a lot of engagement, but that's hard. Yeah. So yeah, then, and, I, and I would add, I would add, just add to that. Um, I mean, Kickstarter has changed a lot over the last 10 years. Right. And will I, 
I appreciated your, your interview with Charles Adler in one of your earlier podcasts where you were talking about kind of the origination of Kickstarter and, and his experience. Um, but it's, you know, originally kind of what Francie just described is, is what we did before the Kickstarter is kind of why Kickstarter was created to begin with in a lot of ways was to get that initial validation and community built around the product before you actually launch it. And I think nowadays with Kickstarter and just as far as the amount of industry that's been built up around it and the expectations that people have when they see a product on there for what they will actually get um, in, in return for their backing, you know, it's, it's, it's just changed a lot. And, and in this specific case, to have a campaign that is really, really successful and raises a lot of money, um, you almost have to do kind of that pre-validation work on your own. Yeah. And, and a lot of times even raise some capital to invest into a campaign before you ever launch. So. Right. Yeah, I think a, a lot, we see this trend in a, in a variety of different communities out there where they start out being great for incubation and incubating ideas. And then as they get bigger, just practically, it's hard to be the kernel of incubation for a lot of these teams. So it, it, it inevitably turns into an accelerator where it's better used once you have some of that early work and early validation already done so that it can accelerate and augment that community uh, around the world, which it sounds like, what looks like at Bird Buddy, you're doing brilliantly so that's that's quite amazing I, I'm, I'm curious just practically how have you communicated with the global audience are there groups on socials of, of email and like how how if people wanted to join this community what what are ways that that you're using to communicate with them Francie? uh so that was largely if not exclusively facebook right mm -hmm. uh so the, the way we set it up is that we 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 built a pre-launch uh, website and then created a couple of uh, Facebook ads uh, and right off the bat they performed great and then we just actually you know uh, needed to put more money in it basically to get more people to engage with the ads and then more people to convert on on on, on our website uh, so I think and, and I, that's also something we've been advised by people uh, regarding Kickstarter marketing and stuff like that that Facebook is still the platform to do that right mm. uh, so no other platform can come close in terms of you know, finding the right audience and engaging with them. Uh, we have some experience with Facebook advertising, so it's not like we, like these were the first ads that we've ever set up, right? So we knew a bit about how to create lookalike audiences and and understand uh, who we're pitching to. Having said that, uh, our you know the demographics we've set uh, for our Facebook ads were broad, and were like uh, smart buildings and uh, you know smart devices. Uh, birds, uh, Alexa, so basically a bunch of different smart slash, you know, nature topics, uh, where the audience in the US, I think was 140 million for, for the ads, which is which is a very broad audience by all definitions, right, but still performed insanely well, which was also one of the main kind of signs of how big the market can be, right, because uh, having a huge audience and also a low cost of conversion uh, is kind of what you're actually looking for, right? If you, if you only find a very niche uh, audience and you convert well with them, then you uh, sooner or later you'll exhaust that audience and, you know, the price will go up. So that, that was kind of a, a good sign that there is something there uh, also to be able to scale, right? So that there's a large enough audience there. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, Facebook ads, uh, driving them to to our uh, pre-launch page. And again, the nice thing of having a pre-launch page and being able to collect emails is that you have then a direct channel to those people, right? And as Kyle mentioned earlier, we have engaged with them a lot with kind of nice, you know, uh, so we, we for, for every... Uh, for every point of engagement, we've built like a nice micro website where we would ask them for the color of bird body or ask them for the features that they prefer, right? So uh, like pretty much, except for the first email, I think everything else was well produced, right? So we, we kind of tried to put that image forward that we, we know what we're doing because we don't know what we're doing, at least when it comes to software development, right, and design. Uh, and, and wanted to kind of uh, uh, justify, you know, that we are a, a solid team building a good product, you know, and 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 we respect our audience and want their feedback to to incorporate into the product, right? Um, so we we, we kind of tried to to um, get that point across with every message that we send out, right? With every form that we've built or every micro page that we built for for people to engage with. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically. I think that you know, again, Facebook ads for advertising and getting to people to you know to 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 see your brand at all, uh, brand at all, and then to to leave their email. But then once you have that email, you have a very 
a direct way of, of talking to your audience. And, and, and if you do that in a meaningful way with content that doesn't look half-baked, I think you're good to go. Yeah, and the, if you haven't seen it, Will, check out the uh, the Facebook page for, for Bird Buddy and oh, yeah. just the, the, the thoughtfulness that has gone into things. Like we've got a lot of questions around um, battery life and, and a lot of different features and the amount of thoughtfulness and care that's gone into like those responses. It's not just writing out the response. Like it was creating an animated video <laughs> that's, that's super cute. Right. And we put it out there, it's on brand. It explains things in 20 seconds that we would have to re-answer a million times with text, which isn't that engaging. So I think just the team is doing an incredible job creating that content and engaging people in really unique ways and making it all fun and on brand. So I think um, just even things like the bird of the day, you know, there's 18,000 species out there and, and almost every day, you know, in my scroll, I see a new one and it's really <laughs> fun and exciting, right? So it's, it's just really nice content. And the encouraging thing too, with, with that community and, and the, the people that are responding, you know, there's very little hate. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and it just, if somebody does come on complaining about something like the community almost takes our back and just starts like fighting our <laughs> battles for us. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's so really hyper practically nice. then it was direct communication via email and Facebook is probably one of the main channels with, with just the Facebook page. You didn't, you didn't do a Facebook group. It was, it was, it was no, just a page. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a page basically that also we ran ads from. Yeah. Because I know a lot of entrepreneurs try to do the Facebook groups and they try to do the Google groups or Slack groups and try to create these little communities and these forums. But yeah. it sounds like you didn't go that direction. It was more just use Facebook. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah no, no. And I think that that would have been too much. And mm. and not like, uh, it, it, honestly, people might appreciate it, but we couldn't handle it, right? Mm. Uh, we have 50,000 people on our mailing list, right? And and I can't imagine how we could fit that many people into a Slack group or, you know, have any kind of meaningful conversation with, with that large amount of people, right? right. So it, that, that really had to be more or less one way, right? Us asking them for feedback and us reaching out to them and then they, giving them a way to engage with us, in a, you know, so, so we could analyze it at a, at a scale. Um, so I think that uh, anything else than that, yeah, we, we have had ideas of maybe making a group for like VIP users or stuff like that, you know, but, but again, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't maybe even want to segregate our, you know, community in, in like classes like that, right? It, it, as, as Kyle mentioned, it's a really wholesome community of people that are generally very nice, right? Um, and, I, and there's, it, 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 there didn't feel, seem to be a reason for us to make any kind of more, you know, private like environments, right? It's, it's all very public and it's all very nice, which, which is pretty uncommon for, for the web, right? <laughs> but but in, our, in our case, it works, I think, yeah. Got it. So for those for those listening in or watching, you obviously get your email address in, and the the URL is mybirdbuddy.com. Is that right? Yep. It is. And then look at is it just Bird Buddy on Facebook? If they just search for Bird Buddy, they'll find it. They should. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it sounds like it's great. So the the ability to answer questions and post things on on Facebook there, and probably the community having conversation in the comments is 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 quite amazing. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, just just the bird of the day thing is, is pretty nice. Like, uh, you know, it's every day we post one, uh, you know, new, new bird species, and there's a short description of like its core features, which is usually uh, kind of on the funny side. And then, uh, you know, depending on the bird, there there can be a pretty interesting discussion <laughs> following it. But uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things that we post every day. And then we already have, like, since since September, I think we've already posted 41 blog posts right and and all of them uh, i mean actually most of them at least like very much worth reading right so um, uh, we're, we're really trying to to provide people with something like uh, to engage with on a daily basis that's that's bird related that's kind of the idea so one one more question before we get to sort of final thoughts here is is around the topic of pr you know a lot a lot of entrepreneurs and founders don't necessarily know how to work with with the journalists and influencers and, and whether to use an agency or, or, or a consultant and, and all things PR, how have you uh, thought about engaging in, in, the, in the PR community around the whole Bird Buddy story? Um, so, yeah, like I think that um, there was a lot of discussion in terms of how much, uh, first of all, how much value PR gets you. And then second of all, how much PR happens on its own if you have a successful Kickstarter campaign, right? And then maybe thirdly, 
uh, you know, what the willingness is of media to actually write about Kickstarter campaigns until they've made a product, until they can get a re review unit and stuff like that. Because this is, um, I mean, I would, I would, you know, be super happy if a large, uh, you know, publication would write something about Bird Buddy. But I, uh, on the other side, I completely understand that that's not something that they would want to do because obviously they don't know us, right? They don't, the product is not there yet, right? We can't deliver something to them for, you know, to use and to review and to play with, around with. Um, and, and I'm honestly, um, I think, like I appreciate articles that that are succinct and and kind of you know tell the story about Bird Buddy and are honest about you know where we are and uh, and who we are, uh, but but I, I wouldn't want somebody writing that it's an amazing product <laughs> because there is no product right that's that's something that I, I would kind of find disingenuous but I guess it's something that would create the most value for us right if somebody uh, a big name you know journalist or uh, an outlet would actually say something amazing about bird buddy that we just couldn't substantiate but we we know right that we want to get there and that we're going to get there so we're super confident about that but but i'd, I'd rather them jump on board when we have a product we can deliver you know we don't really need that much of exposure right now uh, and uh, i i guess it's completely fine if we uh, you know, if, if we get that wave once we actually start, you know, delivering these review units to, to journalists. Um, but having said that, it's I, I feel it's important for us to have some acknowledgement, right? So we have some media presence. So if people Google us, that they know that we've talked to journalists because, you know, obviously they do their job and they ask you questions, which sometimes are hard or tough or whatever. And if you don't have the right answers, Either you're not going to get an article, or you're going to get an, a, you know, a, a, an article that's not that helpful, right? And I think that because we are confident and we we were confident, we have talked to journalists, and we did get articles that that actually pop up if you do Google Bird Buddy, uh, which which kind of validate, you know, our our team and 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 the product even more. So I think that there is obviously value in in uh, getting PR and and getting publications to write about your product. Uh, before Kickstarter and doing Kickstarter, but I guess that the most value, you know, there I think uh, for us is still upcoming. Like, you know, it, it's it's gonna be there once we actually start, you know, shipping units and and uh, yeah, like shipping review units more specifically, I guess, to journalists. Anything you'd add to that, Kyle? I know you work with a, a lot of founders in in this space and sort of navigating those those early early stages. Um, what what sort of things would you would you would you add to that? I think that was a really good summary. I think that's something that we always encounter, right? Is a lot of journalists just say, "Send me one to review." Um, so we we try to navigate around that and do interviews and provide um, some insight or or kind of nugget that would be interesting for them to write about us. But to, I think what Francie said around kind of not having the unit yet and a lot of the value coming later on once we have that. Um, and can send those out. I think that's spot on. So that's amazing. All right. Well, any any final words from the two of you uh, for the aspiring entrepreneurs that are maybe delving into the to the hardware IoT space? What are, what so any any final advice that that you might have for those those listening in? Fr Francie, we'll start with you. <laughs> I have a very general advice. Uh, like, don't be afraid to fail. Right that's uh, it's just a part of the process i you know it's and, and it's uh the sooner you can kind of you know uh, get comfortable with that the better and you'll be a much better entrepreneur for that because most of the ideas you have or you, you land on are just at some point in the process uh kind of um you know show themselves as not great right and and that's all right and once that happens, just let it go and find something else to do, right? Or something else to kind of get you excited and, and work on. Uh, so I, I guess that would be the the, the main thing. And and uh, you know, Bird Buddy right now looks amazing. <laughs> you know, we'll we'll see what happens in a year from now. Kyle mentioned a lot of you know things can go wrong during manufacturing and stuff like that. Uh, I'm I'm very uh, kind of excited uh, that this is going to be you know the thing that actually uh, makes a lot of sense and and you know gives us all reason to wake up for years to come right uh but if 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 uh you know if, if your idea your current idea doesn't work out just don't be afraid to throw it away and, and kind of figure out something else that's great how about you kyle yeah i mean it, pursuing an idea all the way to a business and a you know as a as a long-term thing i mean that's a massive commitment right and so I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and I, and I did this a ton, 
you know, made mistakes, but like there's, you can have a bunch of really great product ideas. You can have a bunch of ideas that you'd be passionate about. And then you can have ideas that like a big market would respond to or not. I think a lot of times people really get stuck on one of those things where they see a huge market for something, but they're not really passionate about it. And maybe it's not the best idea, but you, they can make a lot of money. Like that's not going to be something that like long-term you're going to be happy doing. Mm. Right. And then you pick any one of those three things. Like you might, you might be have something you're really passionate about. The other two aren't falling in line. And I, I, I think a common mistake, one that I have made in the past is like pursuing that no matter what, just because you want to. Mm. And I think sitting back and re, and like taking a really hard introspective look at like, what do you want to do for the next five, 10 years? <laughs> what do you want to be spending, you know, your nights thinking about and, and make sure that it is something that, you know, kind of checks all three of those boxes and, and it makes it worth kind of your time and, and makes it something that you're really excited to wake up and, and start working on. That's amazing. All right. Well, besides mybirdbuddy.com and face, the Facebook page, which we'll link to, how can, how can folks uh, uh, ask the two of you and find you online to, to follow up from this? How, Francie? Uh, I don't have much of an online presence, to be honest. They can, they can find me on LinkedIn, or uh, I guess they can mail me at uh, Francie at mybirdbuddy.com. Uh, that would be the, the easiest, most direct way. Cool. How about, how about you? Kyle? Yeah, same, same, same for me. Link, LinkedIn um, is probably the best. So, Awesome. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you. It's such an amazing project. And thanks for sharing your insights and, and the journey along the way. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Will. Thanks. All right. A couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups, and health science, and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe. And you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it'd be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you. 